Christina, you have that? Yep, let's start it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another session of EMI Live. This is an initiative from the Cleveland Clinic Endocrinology and Metabolism Institute to um, broadcast our grand rounds nationally to improve education among community endocrinologists. Um, today we have an exciting lineup. We have a case uh, of acromegaly from uh, presented by one of our first year fellows, Dr. Alimita Kodali. Uh, we have our panelist, Dr. Divya Yogi Moran. Uh, she is a Clem Clinic Pituitary Center of Excellence Director. Um, then we have Dr. Um, Alexa Miguel. She is one of our staff here and also trained here with us. And then we have Dr. Ned Kennedy, a former chair who's also a pituitary expert. Uh, after that, we have Dr. Susan Sampson from the Mayo Clinic talking about treatment options for acromegaly. Um, so hopefully you will enjoy these talks, uh, starting with Dr. Kodali. Please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Meekin. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, the title of my presentation is A Small Solution for a Giant Problem. Um, and before I start with my presentation, I just wanted to put a picture of Shrek here because as I was reviewing, I realized that the character Shrek was actually inspired by a wrestler, Maurice Tillette, who had acromegaly. Just thought it was interesting. Um, the objectives of today's uh, presentation is I will be describing a clinical case of acromegaly with a complicated course. Uh, briefly discuss potential complications after transphenoidal surgery and then discuss, uh, hopefully we'll have a discussion of the medical treatment options for residual or persistent acromegaly. Starting with my case presentation, this is a 30-year-old male who initially presented to the emergency room at Cleveland Clinic for frontal headache and pressures back in April of 2017. He says that his headaches were on and off since 2011, pressure type with no associated uh, vision symptoms. He also reported at that time that about a couple of months prior to this, he was evaluated at an outside hospital in South Carolina where he was found to have a pituitary mass. Now, upon further questioning, he also reported that he has noticed a growth spurt over the last three or four years, increase in his hand size increase in his shoe size where his right feet was at least one inch larger than his left feet and also noticed a lot of changes to his face, um, including his nose was growing wider, the folds or the ridges on the top of his orbits were enlarging, increasing the size of his lower jaw, swelling around his eyelids. Um, also reported a weight gain of around 50 pounds and increase in height of about two inches after the age of 25. Moving on, uh, in the ED, he was he basically given his history of pituitary mass. Uh, he had a CT head and MRI that confirmed the findings of what he already knew. There was no acute bleed or any acute um, potential cause that needed to be treated uh, right away. So he was managed conservatively for headache and discharged uh, with endocrinology, neurology and ophthalmology uh, follow up. This is his MRI uh, with or without contrast on initial uh, presentation. Uh, as you can see here, there is a cellar mass uh, that was consistent with the findings that we knew uh, with pit pituitary macroadenoma uh, invading the right uh, cavernous sinus. Uh, here, there was also evidence of invasion of the circle of villus area, especially uh, mostly in the supraclinoid right internal carotid artery and the A1 segment. No evidence of aneurysm. The mass was at least in the largest diameter, 3.3 centimeters, it was measuring 2.7 into 2.4 into 3.3 centimeters in, in dimension. Um, he was then evaluated by endocrinology in office in May of 2017. Um, further history at that time revealed no clinical evidence of hyper or hyposecretion of other pituitary hormones. 
Um, he denied any vision defects except for watery eyes and eye discharge, uh, no changes in vision that he reported. Uh, he does wear contacts. Uh, for this eye discharge, he was being evaluated by allergies and at initially was thought was secondary to seasonal allergies. No sleep apnea that he knows of or snoring at night, no increased thirst or urination, no discharge from breast or painful breast or any breast swelling. No darkening of the skin, uh, gums, or salt cravings, no stretch marks or easy bruising, no joint, joint laxity. He did not have any excessive hair growth um, apart from the normal distribution of hair in males. Reported some difficulty raising arms uh, overhead and difficulty getting up from a seated position, especially in the morning. So, Moving on, his past medical history was significant. This is on presentation for hypertension, some seasonal allergies and epilepsy. He's had hand surgery before, but it was reported a surgery secondary to work related. There was no much details in the chart as to what uh, specific hand surgery it was. Uh, he is a, is a current smoker, denied any alcohol or other drug use. His family history was significant for hypothyroidism in the mother. Uh, he reported having a cousin who had similar history of increased size of the hands and feet, who actually passed away from a cardiac condition. Uh, he denied any family history of malignancy and no family history of any pituitary tumors. Symptoms, uh, apart from the weight gain of over 50 pounds over the last five years, some low energy and some generalized weakness with occasional constipation. Otherwise, the rest of his review of systems were negative, unremarkable. So in summary, we have a 30-year-old male with typical clinical characteristics of acromegaly, both acryl and facial features and in, in someone with a known uh, pituitary mass on imaging. So what would we do next? Uh, before we, I answer that question, just wanted to go over uh, some of the guidelines, uh, just reminding us ourselves what, uh, these are from the Endocrine Society guidelines for acromegaly. So for guidelines, you measure IGF-1 levels in patients with typical clinical manifestations of acromegaly, which our patient had, without typical manifestations, but with several other associated conditions like sleep apnea syndrome, type 2 diabetes, debilitating arthritis, carpal tunnel syndrome, mostly bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, hyperhidrosis, and hypertension, and in patients with a pituitary mass. And patients with an elevated or equivocal serum IGF-1 levels, confirmation of diagnosis by finding lack of uh, by finding a lack of suppression of growth hormone to less than one microgram per liter following the uh, documented hyperglycemia during an oral glucose load. I do want to mention here, given our ultra sensitive tests and here in Cleveland Clinic, our cutoff is 0 0.4 uh, micrograms per liter. These are from the guidelines, so I did not want to change it there. Um, and following a biochemical diagnosis, uh, we need to make it do an MRI to confirm the in, uh, to confirm the size and the extent of the uh, mass. And visual field testing of the mass is found to abut the optic chiasm on imaging. Another important thing that I wanted to remind us is. In patients who we initially diagnosed with acromegaly, it is very important to manage and uh, diagnose uh, comorbidities. So evaluating for comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, sleep apnea, and longitudinally monitoring them and managing them. Screening for colon neoplasia with colonoscopy and diagnosis. So this is recommended at the time of diagnosis, but the follow-up uh, they recommend to, uh, to, it's similar to the general population. Thyroid ultrasound if there is a palpable thyroid nodularity and assess for hypo and hypopituitarism and replace hormone deficits if needed. A transvenoidal surgery is, rec is uh, considered as the primary therapy in most patients. And in patients with severe pharyngeal thickness, sleep apnea, high output heart failure, 
therapy with uh, a preoperative therapy with somatostatin receptor ligands uh, is also shown to be beneficial. So moving on, what did we recommend for this patient? Um, evaluation of hormonal hypersecretion and hypopituitarism, visual field testing, further testing with OGTT, neurosurgery evaluation, and we started him on octreotide in anticipation for surgery. Before I move on to labs, does anybody have any questions? We have nothing on the chart. Okay. So, unfortunately, his initial labs or pre-operative labs, uh, though we ordered uh, all the pituitary labs, the only IGF-1 was done, and it was 11.22, as you can see there. And he did have a growth hormone suppression test. Um, the growth hormone and glucose, as you can see, the initial baseline is quite high. It's 83. And, and as you go across across the board, there is there has is, is no evidence of suppression despite the hyperglycemia. I think I'm going to stop you there, Alameda. Uh, what is considered a good OGTD for these patients? Divya, can you comment on that, please? What level of sugar are we looking for? Yeah, so we would like to see the glucose levels go up to probably at least more than 140. So I would say with her uh, 11 a.m. and 11.30 a.m., what, 158 and 166, that is sufficient hyperglycemia from the OGTT to cause suppression of growth hormone in someone who does not have acromegaly. And then she had, um, of course, the levels start, um, the blood sugar levels come down and, um, you know, she still continues to go down, but it's not suppressed. Does the interpretation change in patients who have diabetes in any way? So patients who have diabetes might have elevated um, growth hormone levels um, that might be slightly high. Um, in this case, though, that growth hormone level is very high, much more than could be accounted for just by insulin resistance or um, diabetes. So something to keep in mind that if the patient has diabetes, do the cutoffs change in any way here? I don't think we do, but we just kind of use our clinical judgment to assess how we interpret um, the IG, uh, OGTT test. Thank you. Also, I had a question because I was as I was reviewing that in a patient whom we we know has typical features of acromegaly with an clearly elevated IGF-1, is there really the necessity to do a growth hormone suppression test? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it is necessary, especially as you go on with this case, you have a tumor that's been partially resected um, that you're monitoring. If there is growth of this tumor in the future, it is good to have a reference of how this patient responded when they clearly had fulminant acromegaly prior to treatment. So I use this as you know a baseline. This is clearly abnormal. And in the future, as we monitor this patient, if there's growth of the tumor and we repeat an OGTT a test, we will have something to compare it to. Okay. Um, Dr. Maida, you have a raised hand. I, thank you. I, I really want to ask Divya a question and make a comment. Divya, is the suppression of growth hormone related to hyperglycemia or the rise in insulin? Because really, this is a very normal glucose tolerance test. This is surprisingly normal given someone who's got gross acromegaly. He obviously has a tremendous capacity to produce insulin. So the question here is, are you sure it's the glucose that causes the growth hormone the suppression or is it the insulin? And as I said, I'm surprised at the level of uh, glucose tolerance in this gentleman. This is really a fantastic uh, uh, beta cell capacity. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not certain. I think it might be, um, in this case, probably a rise in the insulin um, as well as the glucose. But you're correct because at the two, three hour marks, she start, starts to bring her, sorry, he starts to bring his blood sugars um, back to normal. So perhaps it's the uh, insulin levels going up, which I don't think were measured in this case. Um, Dr. Kennedy, do you have yes, any comments meant. on the glucose level or insulin level? Um, causing the glucose, sorry, growth hormone suppression? Well, I was just going to say that I think there is still considerable debate as to exactly what is the mechanism of 
suppression of growth hormone during uh, an oral glucose tolerance test in people with acromegaly. I don't think there is a consensus view uh, on this, uh, and perhaps uh, Sue Sampson uh, may be able to weigh in on this as well, but I, I still think it's a matter of uh, debate as to the exact mechanism. Dr. Sampson, we are so glad that you could join us for the case. Would you like to comment on this? Sure. Um, I agree with Dr. Kennedy that it is a, a matter of debate. I guess I always think of um, growth hormone as a counter-regulatory hormone. So as those glucose levels go up, the suppression should go down. I think the debate also extends into when we do growth hormone stimulation with glucagon, uh, what is the mechanism there? So I agree that um, we're not completely sure, but certainly expect full suppression in these patients with, with the glucose if they don't have acromegaly. All right. Uh, we have another question from the chat. Dr. Pantalone is asking that if someone does not have diabetes despite agromegaly, may not have a blood sugar um, event greater than 131 hour post meal. Um, he says, I wasn't aware that the blood glucose had to be above a certain level for the OGTT to be diagnostic. So then the next question is, what do we do if the blood glucose does not reach that level despite um, obvious features of acromegaly? Any comments on that? Yeah, so I'm not sure if this will completely answer that. There isn't really a cutoff value where the blood sugar has to reach a certain level. Um, so Kevin is right that in someone who does not have um, hyperglycemia or diabetes, we might not actually get hyperglycemia. Um, but you can still look at the trend at the one hour point, at the two hour point, you will at least expect the blood sugars to go up even in someone who's normal. And then you can look and see what your trend in um, the growth hormone is. So no, there isn't a specific cutoff for what blood sugar level should be reached. You can look at the trend in someone who does not have diabetes. So I think what we are realizing is because these are all dynamic tests, Clinical judgment is playing a big role here in the interpretation, especially if the patient has comorbidities that might or might not affect the interpretation. Uh, go ahead, Alan. All right. So moving on with what happened with the patient. Uh, after a few weeks of receiving oxytide, he finally had surgery in September of 2017. Um, it, was the, it was a subtotal resection with only parts of the intra, uh, intracavernous and supracavernous portion largely debulked. Uh, central portion was able, they were able to remove it completely and they were able to decompress the right optic nerve. Pituitary gland and infundibulum were preserved. On pathology, focal uh, positive staining with antibody to growth hormone was noted and the tumor did not stain for any other pituitary hormone antibodies. A densely granulated pattern of immunoreactivity was observed and a KS67 lethal index of approximately 2 to 3 percent was noted. These points are important or the pathology is important for us in, uh, in a patient with acromegaly because uh, hopefully in our discussions uh, we will talk about how, uh, how the different pathology has an effect in the reactivity of uh, or the, the effect of uh, somatostatin receptor ligands as a, when we talk about treatments for this patient. Moving on, um, in the post uh, immediate post-op period, uh, these were his labs. You can see clearly that compared to the 83-something level preoperatively at the time of his growth, uh, growth hormone suppression test, uh, his growth hormone level did come down significantly to 12.33 and eventually was coming down further. The IGF-1 is still elevated. It does take um, longer time to, to uh, reduce or normalize. That's why her recommendations, we wait at least up to six weeks after post-operatively to check an IGF-1 level. And it, this is where he, at this point, he did have the re remaining pituitary labs ordered. Um, unfortunately, the patient did end up having a prolonged hospital course, almost three months, had multiple complications that I will quickly go over. 
um, in, in the immediate intra-op uh, phase or during the surgery, he ended up having injury to his internal carotid that was controlled with cauterization. Following that, he had a right frontal hematoma with edema and subarachnoid hemorrhage. He had a transient DI, multiple episodes of unresponsiveness. And what was interesting is on angiogram during those periods, he had vasospasms of several branches of his carotid artery and which was treated with verapamil. And he had bi developed bilateral blindness. This was an unfortunate situation. There was no injury to the optic nerve. Uh, still, he developed acute bilateral occipital infarctions in the PCA distribution, uh, leaving him uh, blind. Um, some of the images, this was the uh, sub uh, arachnoid hemorrhage in this uh, hematoma, and this is the MRI showing this bilateral occipital infarcts. Moving on, he had you no, know, just he had transient ICP elevations, all secondary to worsening edema around this subarachnoid hemorrhage, the sub hematoma that he developed. He requiring eventual craniotomy to help with that, which didn't improve. He ended up having herniation because of that. He had to have craniectomy followed by ventricular peritoneal shunting. He then developed LFT elevation with biliary sludge in the gallbladder. However, at that time, uh, only conservative management was recommended by surgery. He had recurrent CSF leak after the initial CSF leak during in the immediate post-op period uh, and purulent discharge that required treatment with antibiotics. And he developed several complications from uh, or uh, reactions to the antibiotics itself later on. He also developed tachycardia, bilateral upper extremity tremors, and spasticity concerning for dysautonomia. I thought this was very interesting. There has been no uh, reports as such that directly uh, describe dysautonomia in a patient with a pituitary surgery, but there are uh, reports where dysautonomia can occur in patients who've had traumatic brain injury. So my thought was, given the multiple things that happened to him in the course of this hospitalization, it's possibly causing the dysautonomia because of the hypothalamic dysfunction was my thought process. I don't know if anybody has any other um, experience or thoughts about that. All right, so moving on, uh, briefly, what I wanted to, that, that was the end of my case. I will talk about what treatment um, we, we went on after the slide. So moving on, is there really an algorithm for acromegaly? Per endocrine society guidelines, management of acromegaly, um, transphenol surgery is the first, is, is what's recommended in most patients, unless if the tumor is unresectable or, and, there's, and there is no chiasmal co uh, compression, in those situations, uh, medications can be used as the first uh, line. Now, in transpernoidal surgery, either you achieve remission uh, or there could be persistent disease after. Now, several factors, um, sorry. So moving on, the medications that we can use or th that are used in acromegaly, I thought this was a very nice slide just to go over where, uh, what medications are used. As you can see, the GHRH and somatostatin is what uh, are the driving factors. The GHRH um, is a positive feedback somatostatin, a negative feedback to production of growth hormone from the pituitary gland. The treatments that are targeting specifically the pituitary gland are surgery, radiotherapy, dopamine agonists, and somatostatin analogs. And then we have the next group where the growth hormone receptor antagonist that's targeting more the peripheral tissues and thereby causing a decrease in IGF-1 and, uh, and, and then a decrease in all the metabolic effects of the IGF-1 production. Now, when we talk about the dop dopamine agonist somatostatin analogs, the medications that are available are cabergoline, octreotide, lanreotide, and pisereotide. Um, the octreotide includes both the uh, parental form and the more recent uh, oral form as well. Growth hormone antagonists, here we have the pegvisamant. 
surgery, it is recommended as a fa the favorite approach is transphenoidal or there's really no differentiation on in studies depending on whether it was an endo uh, endoscopic approach versus like a microscopic approach. Uh, and successful surgery basically means immediate lowering of growth hormone levels and also it provides tissue for pathological characterization. And uh, most studies show that the outcomes in pituitary surgeries for the most part depend on surgeon's experience and the patient load, uh, basically meaning caseload of that particular center. The remission rates vary and there are several factors that have been studied as to how they vary or what the difference is. Overall, they vary between 34 to 85 percent. In microadenomas, we can, is a little uh, be, the remission rate is a little better, about 75 to 90 percent, um, and 45 to 70 percent in macroadenomas. I think it's pretty intuitive. The smaller tumor, I guess, the likelihood of removing the tumor and mass is more uh, is better. Um, in terms of total tumor re resection and remission, they were significantly higher in men than in women. Uh, and this was most more likely due to the fact that women are noted to present much later on in uh, when it comes to the age at initial presentation, uh, though they have uh, initial the IGF-1 levels are lower than men on initial presentation, but because they are presented much later on in in uh, in, in in life and mostly larger tumors. Um, and overall, the age was not um, uh, seen to be or noted or studied to be um, any specific predictor for surgical outcomes. Just a brief note on post-op complications. Um, mostly surgical, you have the CS of fleet, bleeding, intracranial infections, um, medical sodium water imbalances, uh, DI, um, SIADH, and new or worsened hypopituitarism. These are things that we as endocrinologists have to keep in mind as we are treating them immediate postoperatively or in long-term follow-up as well. And other major complications, which are very rare, are internal carotid in artery injury and visual loss. Um, unfortunately, our patient has had all of these issues, all of these complications. Um, yeah. So moving on, uh, what happened with our patient? Postoperatively, uh, it was continued on octreotide and due to persistent elevated IGF-1 beyond six weeks. Around November, he was star also started on kebergoline. Uh, he recovered pretty well and was able to be discharged to a rehab facility. He came to see us around March of 2018 while he was still on uh, octreotide, 150 uh, every eight hours kebergoline. And uh, I, what I didn't mention before, he was also on hydrocortisone uh, 20 and 10 and leave with the rocks in 125 at that time. And the plan was to start long acting uh, somatostatin receptor ligands, which he was started in July and continued on the kebergoline. Uh, around November, when he came to the office, he had significantly improved. He was discharged home from rehab and was able to walk with a cane, able to do some of his activities, though he was still dependent on his mom for a lot of his ADLs. Um, on follow-up labs, um, after he was on, on this medication, uh, you can see that the IGF-1 did reduce compared to the previous numbers that were in the in the still in the 900s, although still very elevated from 700 to 639. And next subsequent visit, he was reduced. Uh, his levothyroxine dose was adjusted. He the landreotide was increased to 120 every four weeks, with subsequent plan to add pegvisamant if needed. And he was started on testosterone IM injections. Unfortunately, he developed another complication around May 2019 while he was on the higher dose of landreotide, was admitted for abdominal pain with concern for cholecystitis. In July 2019, the landreotide was stopped because of gallstones, and he was started on pegvisamant at 10 milligrams. Uh, and in August of 2019, uh, he had a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So, following that, uh, following the starting of pegvisamant, the, the, his insulin uh, uh, IGF-1 reduced from 639 to 525. 
In December, uh, the PEGVA cement was increased. We were still on the cabergoline, and these are his labs on these medications. So as you can see, subsequent uh, IG of one, it did reduce to 374, 196. And the most recent lab that we have is 244. Um, that's the end of my presentation. All right, so we have a long case. I have I have to give credit to all the pituitary experts on our panel who have probably seen the case at one time or another because this is a difficult, long uh, management. So starting with Dr. Yogi Moran, uh, what else can we offer this patient and what would you do about the cholecystitis issue that has come up? Okay. So we have a couple cases. So his um, IGF level most recent was 244 nanograms per mil, so just two above the range of normal. Um, so he's already on PEG 20. So one option is to go ahead and escalate that dose. Um, in the clinical trials, increasing doses from 10, 15 to 20 resulted in dose-dependent reductions in IGF. Um, escalating to 40, um, normalized IGF in about 97% of patients. Of course, in a real-life setting, its success rate is closer to around 60%. The other option, because this patient is blind, and this is a sub-Q daily injection, so his mom is concerned if he's ever going to be independent, he needs to stop taking injections and move to oral medications. So that brings in our discussion about cabergoline and its use. So cabergoline is okay. used as adjunctive therapy um, um, in patients that have almost gotten to normal with their IGF. So if we continue PEG, one option is just to increase the carbergoline and see if we could dip that IGF into the normal range. Um, doses going up to about one milligram twice a week are effective. Um, after that, there's not much reduction in IGF. And then, um, because of all the you know hype around oral octreotide, the mom was also interested in whether or not this would be an option for him. And if you look at the slide that Alamita has up, he was successful in, um, well, almost successful in almost normalizing his IGF with the 120 of lanreotide. So that might be an indicator that he will respond to oral octreotide, although oral is less effective than injectables. So oral um, octreotide has a response rate, I think, around 60%, whereas injectables are about 90%. So he has he may respond well to octreotide, oral octreotide. And as for the cholecystitis issue, I would say that is no longer an issue since he had cholecystectomy. Um, that's my response to that. <laughs> Dr. Mikhail, would you like to add something to Dr. Yogi Mara? You know, uh, I think... Um... Dr. Yogi already explained and gave a lot of different options. The one thing I would say that the benefit of oral octreotide in this case is you basically get the same adverse effects as injectable uh, SR somatostatin receptor ligands, but without the injection Inject site reaction. And given the fact that he is currently blind, it may be difficult. And I think focusing on his quality of life and our goals of therapy for this patient is very important. You know, our, we are looking to, you know, normalize IGF-1 levels. We also want to minimize symptoms of acromegaly, but also we need, need to look at his overall, you know, independent function and what's going to happen in a few years, for example, if there's no one to actually care for him directly. I think that's an excellent point. We as physicians sometimes like to treat numbers and forget to look at the individual as somebody who has a life outside the hospital. So thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Dr. Kennedy, I have a question for you. Do remission rates improve for mac macroadenomas if pretreated with somatostatin analogs? Uh, the literature on that is uh, very varied. Uh, some centers uh, believe that it is uh, a useful thing. Uh, and we do tend to we have tended to do that at Cleveland Clinic, uh, but there is no hard evidence that pretreatment with somatostatin receptor ligand actually improves the remission rate. Uh, I would add a couple of other comments. Uh, Dr. Yogi Moran mentioned that with uh, pegvisimant, you expect over 90% uh, normalization of IGF-1. That was certainly achieved in the uh, initial studies back in the 1990s. The, the follow-up, she said uh, that, of course, uh, in real life, it's lower. I think one of the reasons it's lower in real life is that there is a tendency not to escalate the dose. 
uh, as much as it should. And also, uh, I think uh, real life practice with trying to get peg visament approved and delivered on time to the patient uh, plays a role as well. And I, the final thing I would say at this, there is another oral option, uh, which wasn't included on the slide, uh, but uh, Marcelo Bronstein in Brazil has shown that in patients with modest elevations of IGF-1, certainly in men, uh, that the addition of clomiphene can uh, be helpful. And I've actually used this in one patient with success. Oh, excellent point. I have had no idea. Um, we will have to wrap this up. So I'm going to finish with asking Dr. Sampson, what does she think of the case and how would she manage it at her center? Thank you so much. That was a, a really intriguing case. Um, and it was unfortunate to have the patient um, have to deal with the complications. But I think most of us would say for the majority of our patients, both at your center and at ours, they do very well after this surgery. And also, I guess one of the things that was very apparent early in the case was that this patient had had a long history of growth hormone excess. And again, emphasizing the delay in diagnosis in this patient, which I will emphasize in a couple of the cases in my talk as well. All right. Um, thank you so much. We are going to wrap up the case now. Um, Christina, can you please stop the recording?